So, so this fourth session, I, I did want to pull some things together that I sort of pointed at in the last three sessions or the previous three sessions, I guess would be the right way to phrase this. And I'm, I'm going to, on the one hand, talk a lot about basics of um, Vajrayana, of Buddhist Tantra. But at the same time, I'm going to be talking about some very psychological um, perspectives. And I'm going to frame this all within the context of my own experience. So I mentioned this at the very beginning of the series of talks. And the other thing I said at the beginning of the series of talks <clears throat> was the way that I understood what I was going to be doing was to be kind of painting a picture, start like a tanka, starting with grid lines and filling in the image, drawing in the image, and then start painting in the colors. And uh, so my wife is a tanka painter. You'll see some of her images shortly. And um, often what she does is she'll do one color in a lot of different locations, and then another color in a lot of different locations. And then sometimes she'll finish an entire figure. And then she'll get to a place where there's just one figure left, which is what the situation is with the painting she's working on right now. She's working on her second Parnashawari Tonka. And there's a yellow Tara in the upper right-hand corner that needs to be finished. And then her eyes, the Parnashawari's eyes can be opened and it's, it's all done. So I kind of feel like where I'm at now is there's sort of a metaphoric yellow Tara up in the corner of my talks. And I'm going to be sort of painting her in today. And then maybe we're gonna open the eyes or maybe we're not, that's hard to say. Opening eyes is like getting enlightened, I suppose. And maybe that would be a bit much to expect that we would get enlightened today. Be nice, wouldn't it? But probably not terribly likely. <clears throat> Unless, of course, we were Zen students, then we would say, hey, it could happen anytime. And uh, I might actually even get to that, depends on where we go today. So, so I've made a big thing in the past about this psychologist called Edward Whitmont, and in particular, a book of his called um, Return of the Goddess, which has been incredibly influential uh, for me. A very, um, I think a very profound, uh, a very profound study. And uh, I wish I'd had the opportunity to meet Edward Whitman. I could have, but at the time I had the opportunity, I didn't, he was still writing the book. And I didn't know that much about him really. Um, he was actually part of a crew of people that I was trying to put together for a book on Jungian psychology and um, Tibetan Buddhism which never happened because I got tired of living on the East Coast and I moved back to California and said, forget about all this stuff. Um, and that's too bad for all kinds of reasons. But when I was on the West Coast, um, I did discover Edward Whitman. And as I've said here, he talked about an evolution of consciousness. And he talked about it going through three phases just to recap this which was from a magical to a mythic to a rational phase. And the point he was making is that most of us are fairly stuck in our rational minds. Um, <clears throat> and that psychoanalysis, Jungian or Freudian, which are now very out of favor, but uh, these kind of approaches make it a point to look at our dream lives, to look at what he called the mythic state of consciousness because that element of ourself contains a lot of emotional energy, some of which is free flowing, some of which is blocked, some of which you're not even aware of in the slightest. And as I also mentioned, Gregory Bateson, someone else who's had a big influence on me, made a point in some of his writings that with the development in the Western history, uh, the Reformation, something was lost in the Western mind's ability to think mythically. And his point, the point he makes, is that in the Catholic Church, 
this is the example he uses. In the Catholic Church, where you have the Mass as the primary ritual that takes place, you have the blessing of wine and bread, and through the priest's blessing of wine and bread, they're converted into the blood and the body of Christ. And because of that magical operation, they have the ability to save you from sin, to cleanse sin, to open the doors to heaven, in fact. At the time of the Reformation, the view that developed was that's only symbolic. The blood, excuse me, the wine and the bread are only symbolic. They represent the blood of Christ and they represent the body of Christ, but they are not literally the blood and body. And the Catholics said, if it's only symbolic, it, had, it can't save anymore. And so there were unbelievable battles with much bloodshed, horrific battles over these issues. That's how important this was to the people of the time. And we forget this sort of thing. We forget that the symbolic world that we live in has tremendous power and that has even potentially more power if we understand it to be literally what it appears to be and not a symbol for something else. We don't tend to really accept that too much, although sometimes we do. Back when I was a young man, there was something going on called the Vietnam War. <clears throat> and at the time of the Vietnam War, a lot of people my age were burning American flags because they were making a statement about what they considered to be American imperialism in Asia. I don't think the statement was wrong. I don't know that burning flags was a great thing, but they burned flags because it made a point. It made a point very powerfully. It made a point emotionally. And a lot of people reacted to flag burnings very viscerally. So for them, the flag wasn't a mere symbol. It was almost literally the territory, the physical territory of the United States. And so burning it was a direct assault on the country. There was nothing merely symbolic. Now, I mentioned this just to say that these kinds of relationship with images still exist for us. We're often not so aware of the fact that they do. And that's because especially those of us who are highly educated, like most of us have probably gone to college, which means we've gotten locked into the rational mind very deeply. <clears throat> and we may have gotten locked out of the mythic emotional mind, which is associated with dreams and is associated with the stories, which are myths. Now, the thing that's really amazing about Vajrayana, about Buddhist Tantra, is that although most of the modern world has gone down the path of Euro-American culture from the point of view of being rational in its nature, the Lamas in the Tibetan tradition have managed to develop extremely rational minds without losing their mythic mind and without losing their magical mind. The kind of stuff that happened in the West is not what happened in Tibet. They developed a very rational culture. I mean, if you read Tsongkhapa, an amazingly rational person. And at the same time, they cultivated their dreaming minds, their mythic minds. And the way they did this was by practicing Tantra, by practicing Vajrayana. They had the ability to go into these different levels of mind which Westerners, especially modern Westerners, are not quite so capable of doing unless they work at it. And if you work at it, you can do it. I've been practicing highest yoga tantra. I've been practicing Yamantaka for 35 years. And I'm a pretty rational person. Just ask my students at the university. I teach philosophy at Portland State University. They'll say he's fairly rational, not as rational as their other philosophy teachers, but fairly rational. And if you ask my wife, she'll say, well, when she met me 35 some years ago, I was disgustingly rational. And thank God, things have been softening up over the years. And one of the reasons things have been softening up is, of course, her 
doing her magic on me, but also the practice of Vajrayana. So now I can slip into that state by practice. And it's a very extraordinary thing that happens when we do this. Now, the other thing I pointed out uh, earlier on, and I wanna loop back to this because I'm gonna be talking about the clear light consciousness. I'm gonna be talking about dying and rebirth and these sort of things. Um, <clears throat> in the practice of Buddhist Tantra, there are two things that are very important. Again, this is by way of a recap. One is clear image, clear insight, clear vision. And the other is what's called divine pride. When you're practicing, for example, I gave the, um, we went through the white Tara sadhana, which is a lower tantra, so we could do that. Um, when you're practicing, you don't merely imagine that this image of a bodhisattva or that's the technical term for what you would be imagining, uh, like white Tara. You don't really imagine that Tara is there someplace. Ah, hello, Anil and Janice. You're out taking a walk, I see. Mm -hmm. So you don't merely imagine that um, Tara is there in your presence, but actually you imagine yourself as being Tara. You designate your sense of I onto that clear image of Tara with as much forcefulness and conviction as possible so that you practice yourself as being Tara. And this is very important. And um, the reason it's so important, well, there are a lot of reasons why it's important, but one reason why it's important is, in fact, Tara is some part of yourself already. You know, different Taras represent different things, but we could say that Tara represents compassion, loving kindness, these sorts of things. And you have that within you already. So practicing Tara is a way of cultivating more of that. And the more clearly you imagine Tara and the more forcefully and devotedly you imagine yourself as Tara, you bring that potency into your life. And it's not the case that you merely do it as in sleeping or slipping into a dream, which would be a very forceful way to practice it. But you practice and you have your rational mind and your dreaming metaphoric mind going on at the same time. So that your rational mind knows you're designating yourself as Tara while your metaphoric mythic dreaming mind, as it were, absolutely feels you are Tara. Now, this seems like a very unusual thing to do. It's not something that's known in psychotherapy, for example. I mean, the Freudians and the Jungians would say, bring me a dream and tell me what the dream images mean to you. And they may say, well, let your imagination run along and see what kind of ideas come up and what kind of feelings come up and what kind of associations come up because this mythic mind is associational in the way it operates. And if you go back to the uh, two syllogisms that I presented earlier, the grass syllogism and the uh, Socrates syllogism, I won't go into them now, you'll see what's meant by associationist thinking. I think I presented those in the second talk rather than the first. Stephen's saying, yes, he's got a good memory. I'm getting kind of old for having a good memory. So thank you. <clears throat> so where was I? Oh yeah. So they would have you be associational in the way you're functioning, but they would not have you be the image that you're talking about. Although there are some kinds of psychotherapy that might have you do that. But in the practice of Tantra, you are it. Now, how is it possible that you can be it and that this would have such potency? Well, it's because all the images of the bodhisattvas that you work with in Tantra are in fact manifestations of the qualities of the Buddha. In fact, manifestations, the qualities of your Buddha nature. So for example, Akshobhya, who sits with his hand in his lap and one hand down like this, um, is actually associated with what's called a mirror-like wisdom. 
Okay. But that capacity is in you to just reflect what is actually presented to you. And the same with all the other bodhisattvas. Manjushri, who holds a sword and a book. Bodhisattva of wisdom. But wisdom is something that you naturally possess already. It's there in you, but it's covered over. And much of meditation practice, especially the purification practices that you may know of in long room, are removing the obscurations that cover what's naturally within you. So that's one kind of practice. And if we actually do talk about um, some of the origins of Zen, um, we'll get him, get him that theme in a big way. I'm not sure if we're gonna go there or not, but we might. Okay, but the main thing is that in practicing Vajrayana, you're bringing all these minds together at the same time. You're developing capacities that you actually have that are unused and that the ability to use these capacities releases all kinds of um, abilities within you that are perhaps not fully developed. Release the wisdom within you to see the truth of what's going on. Release the compassion within you to understand the truth of your relationship with other people and then do something about it to act on that basis. It also does things like gives you the ability to encounter fears and do something about fears to transform fears because we're full of fear. How do we deal with fear? Um, do we just say, well, there it is, or do we act it out in some way, or can we do something else with fears to transform them? And so in Tantra, there are ways to deal with these things. Now, let me do some screen sharing here. And I'll give you some examples of some things I'm talking about here. Okay, who can share? Only the host. Pardon me while I work my way into this. Oh, how about all participants? Who can start sharing? Why is it doing this? I thought screen sharing was pretty straightforward. Ah, here we are. Here we go. Okay. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to share this. I wanted to share this image on the left. Um, this is the Lord of Death. This is the way Tibetans portray death. And this is a painting by my wife. It's a corner of a larger painting. Uh, Tibetans portray death as a minotaur, sort of the body of a man, the head of a bull. And it's said that he is ferocious, absolutely ferocious in his desire, his lust for life. Not like Van Gogh's lust for life, but like thirst for eating life. And by the way, Right here, there's a female version of him called Chamunda or Chamundi. Now, fear of death is something that we all have at some level. <clears throat> but what do we do about it? So as I said, Tantra provides opportunities to work with it by working with this image. And because images are associational, all kinds of interesting things come out when you start working with this image. For example, um, to share some of my own thoughts, um, why is it that there is both male and female together here? Why is it that this minotaur has a consort who's quite ferocious looking, by the way? Well, what's the origin of death in our lives? I'd say any takers, anyone wanna try? Steve? You're muted, Stephen. Birth? Yeah, birth? I, I would say birth is the origin of death. Exactly. And so who's responsible for that? Well, mom and dad. <laughs> so here's mom and dad. Look at what they've given you. They've given you death. I mean, so mom and dad are nice people too, of course but they've also given you death, haven't they? So that's occurred to me when I was looking at this image, yeah. Okay, I'm sure that my parents would be excessively unflattered to hear <laughs> this. 
However, they're gone, so we don't have to worry about it. And if they've taken birth in new lives someplace, they don't know they're my parents. So I'm not insulting them. It's not a problem. Okay, so much for this image. Now, Whitman, if you happen to read the book, um, which um, I'll suggest you do, because it's a great book, makes a point of saying that in his view, there's psychotherapy, which is about healing ills, but there's also psychotherapy for lack of a better term, which is about developing your awareness and growing. And so he would say that's about integrating into yourself what's been lost in the evolutionary history of humanity, right? In the evolutionary history of humanity, we live in a period of time that's often called the patriarchy because male images are dominant, men are dominant. Fortunately, that's changing in the 20th and 21st century, but up until now, that's the way it's been for the last several thousand years. But there's a lot of archeological and mythological evidence to argue that before that period of time of male dominance, mythic male dominance, the primary image of the deity of God, of ultimate reality, was not male. It was not an old man in the sky with a long white beard. It was not Jesus on the cross. It was not Shakyamuni Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree. It was not Confucius. It was a goddess. It was female. And why female? Because the archaic societies understood things as not being linear, starting in one place and going to another place. They understood things as being cyclic, as being circular. You plant the corn seed, the corn grows. You pull the ears off the seed, I pull the, the seed off the ears. You eat some, you save some and you plant that seed and more corn grows. Year after year, the cycle of life goes on. Things grow, they live, they die, but they grow again. They live, they die, they grow again. They live, they die. That concept has come to us through Buddhism and Hinduism as rebirth, reincarnation. I say that concept, I could also say that reality. But in this context, I'm saying it's a way of looking at what existence is. And so before the patriarchy, the hypothesis is, it can't be proven probably, but the hypothesis is that the principal deity was a goddess. And what came forth from the goddess was life and what returned to the goddess was life. But the goddess persisted over time. And the goddess had consorts, male consorts, because of course, there's not only goddesses, there have to be gods along with goddesses. But the interesting point that Whitmont makes is that typically the male consort of the goddess was a bull or a minotaur, a man with a bull's head, who was the consort of the goddess, who was the child of the goddess, who was the consort of the goddess, and was ultimately consumed by the goddess, and then was reborn. This is the archaic myth, and it can actually be found all over the world if you look for it. So here, what do we have? We have a bullheaded being who is representing death. So what is this bullheaded being representing? Not merely death, but death is the beginning of life, representing the cycle, the cycle of life and death. And in that sense, to the extent that you work with these kinds of images in Vajrayana, keeping your rational mind to understand this, but being fully emotionally engaged with the imagery, although in this case, you don't become, you don't become when you're practicing Yama, the Lord of Death, but you relate to Yama, the Lord of Death. Um, you develop the capacity to relate to the fact of your own life and death as part of a cycle on an emotional level, not just on an intellectual level, but on an emotional level. So that's 
These are images that are very archaic that have been gifted to us by the Vajrayana teachers so that we can begin working with these things. Now I've talked about the goddess, so we should look at the goddess. Now, hold on a minute, let's see if I can get this. There we go, okay. So I talked about white Tara, okay. So I've said that the female, the feminine, the goddess, which exists within the mythic consciousness of all beings. Okay, hold on a minute, Steve. Okay, the goddess which exists within the mythic consciousness of all beings um, takes on different forms. You can work with the goddess in different kinds of ways. So here, White Tara is actually known to be the Tara who grants immortality, who grants bountiful life, not just immortality. As Zachuji Rinpoche said, um, you can think of her as the goddess of immortality, who grants immortality, and that's what's going on with this hand. She's offering immortality. Um, but you can also think of her as offering bountifulness, richness of life, not necessarily richness of wealth, but wholesome richness, whatever that means. The ability to live fully is the way I would see it. And she's a manifestation of this form of Buddha, which is um, Amitabha. And Amitabha is one of the five Dhyani Buddhas who is an aspect of the Buddha. Okay, so keeping these things in mind, right? But of course, as I just said, the goddess doesn't just have one form because the goddess gives life, but the goddess also takes life. So here we have Pandamamo, another painting of Kays. And I'm gonna move it because it looks to me like she's partly covered up by the images on the screen here. Pandalamo is the great protector in Tibet. Uh, according to one story, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama had to flee for his life in 1959 after the failed uprising in Lhasa, um, he had a tube that he carried on his back and he was dressed like a soldier, so the, like a Chinese soldier, so that he could get away. So if he was spotted on his horse, um, he wouldn't arouse too much suspicion. Obviously, if he was wearing golden robes, it would have been a little bit of a problem. And over his shoulder, he had a tube, uh, which looked like it might've been a rifle in the dark. But in fact, there was a rolled up tanka in it of Pandalamo, the great protector. <clears throat> but Pandalamo could be seen also as the other aspect of the goddess, which devours. And in fact, here we have a little being in Pandalamo's mouth. And here are these ornaments of skulls and flayed heads and um, flayed body, here's skin. I mean, she's really terrifying, okay? And yet she said to be a protector. So the brilliance of the tantric practitioners is that they've taken this aspect of the divine feminine, this aspect of our feminine nature, which could be understood in many ways in Buddhist Tantra, as the wind energy, for example, is one way of understanding this characteristic or this goddess. Um, what they've done is they've taken this energy, this quality, and they've turned her into a protector. This fierceness, which so it might be something you fear because she's said to be a cannibal. They've taken this fierceness and they said, she's a Dharma protector. According to myth, she's taken this form in order to protect the students of the Dharma, the practitioners of the Dharma. What a brilliant idea to take that which is fearful and make it your ally rather than your enemy and that which you fear. So again, this is the power of Tantra. White Tara on one side, Pandalamo on the other side, okay? And these are all practices that you can do. In fact, I practice with Pandalamo every night. And um, it opens you up to aspects of yourself that are important.
Okay. Now, let me stop screen sharing because if I leave these images up, we will be seriously distracted. <laughs> we will be, they're very compelling. <clears throat> then let me have a drink here. Okay, so I've talked about in Vajrayana bringing together the rational mind and the mythic mind, which is the mind we get into when we're asleep and dreaming. But as I also pointed out, there's another mind, which is the mind of dreamless sleep. In the mind of dreamless sleep, none of the sense organs are functioning, right? And we talked about this. And this is well known in Western thought. When you're awake, your five physical senses are functioning. And if you happen to be a Buddhist, you know that your mental sense organ is functioning also. That's what's usually called a mind in the Western world, but it's a sense organ in the Buddhist world. And when you fall asleep and you start dreaming, your five physical sense organs are no longer functioning and only the mental sense is functioning. And the images that you have when you're dreaming come from bits and pieces of memory that you have. And the images are, and the narratives are created by karma. The winds of karma, as they say, are what put together the narratives of your dreams. Now there are yogas that allow you to dream consciously, to know that you're dreaming when you're dreaming. Uh, in the modern Western world, we call that lucid dreaming. It's something that's not unknown. Uh, I knew a businessman who was a lucid dreamer. He was an unbelievably successful businessman because he harnessed his ability to lose lucid dream to think of great ways to do advertising and to manage his business. <laughs> and that would sound like, okay, maybe that's a little bit grim to use things in that way. But he was a very, very unusual person, very remarkable person. And... Um, I was actually just, he's, he's passed away now. I was just talking with his wife today who has inherited the business. And she said, well, there are all these great people who run the business for me. I don't have to worry about it too much because my husband thought that the thing to do was to be sure that people were so talented that they could get a job anywhere, but pay them so well they didn't want to leave and go somewhere else to get a job. That's a very enlightened attitude, right? I mean, this, this is a person who brought real value out of whatever, which included, I think, lucid dreaming, okay? All right, well, that is, that's an aside. I'd love to get into these side stories. And I like, especially like telling stories about people who are remarkable that are worth telling stories about. But I try not to mention any names. I didn't even mention what business he did. Anyway, Tsongkhapa has written extensively about ways in which one can bring the conscious mind into the dream state. It's a very advanced practice um, in which one can do things like um, having developed a direct understanding, a direct experience of emptiness, shunyata, bring it into the dream state so that one understands and directly experiences dream images and dream narratives as empty, devoid of inherent existence. Because when we dream, everything that we experience in a dream is charged with energy, charged with emotion, charged with feeling. Everybody's woken up out of nightmares. We know that's true. And probably everyone's woken up out of dreams that they wish they wouldn't wake up out of because they were so wonderful, right? In a sense, the colors can be even more remarkable than the colors in everyday life. I've had this experience on occasion. Like, wow, well, why did I have to wake up? That's gone. I can't get back to it. More frequently, oh, thank goodness I woke up. That was terrible. <laughs> you know, glad that dream is over. Okay. To understand the empty nature of those kinds of images is a very profound experience. But in fact, when you're practicing Vajrayana, and you're working with white Tara or any of the other images, you need to understand that they're empty in character, that they're devoid, that they're shunya, 
okay? That they're luminous, that they're not solid, right? And that they emerge from something. And they emerge from what? In all the images that you work with, the process is out of emptiness arises a lotus. And on the lotus, a sun or a moon disk, and upon the sun or a moon disk, a seed syllable that's associated with the name of the deity that you're going to practice, the bodhisattva you're going to practice. And from that seed syllable, that sound, comes the image of the deity. So in the case of Tara, which you talked about last week, um, a white palm for Padma, Sanskrit for lotus, turns into a lotus. And upon that, a white ah turns into a moon disk. And from the ah, moon disk, pops up like a fish out of water, tam, which is the sound of Tara. And from tam comes Tara. But the important point is they come out of emptiness. Always arise out of emptiness. Now, our tendency is to think that that means empty space. But it doesn't mean empty space, right? It means the empty character of what's real. And in this case, it means the empty character of your own consciousness. So this is a real challenge to meditate on the empty nature of your own consciousness. It's kind of easier to think, oh, um, I'm looking at a flower, okay? The flower comes from a bud. The bud grows out of um, the plant itself. The plant came from a seed. Um, from the seed comes the plant, from the plant comes the bud, from the bud comes the flower. The flower dies off and from the flower emerges a fruit. And then from the fruit emerges more seeds and from the seeds emerge more plants. So that's the cycle we've been talking about. But the point is, right, it emerges, the transformation process is a way of talking about an emptiness of solidity. It's one of the kinds of emptinesses, okay? If you apply that way of thinking to your own consciousness, your own mind, your own awareness, that's very powerful, but it's also difficult and a little bit scary in fact, because we are pretty well seated in our own awareness as being something solid and dependable that we can rely upon. That's always there. We know what it is and we are it maybe, or maybe we don't think we are it. Maybe we think we have it. Depends upon your view on things. But when you get into meditating on your own consciousness as being shunya, as being devoid of inherent existence, devoid of solidity, devoid of permanence, that starts getting a little bit um, unnerving. But if you think about it, it's obviously the case. I mean, for one thing, we know that we have different forms of consciousness. We've been talking about waking, sleeping, and dreamless sleep. These are obviously different forms of consciousness. And in the Buddhist sense, what dreamless sleep is about is awareness of nothing. It's not unconscious in the Western sense, but rather in dreamless sleep, what's happened is just as when we fall asleep, and we dream, the physical senses are no longer operating, but the mental sense is operating. In dreamless sleep, the mental sense stops operating and there's only consciousness without an object. The emptiness, and that's the emptiness that the lotus comes out of and all the bodhisattvas come out of is that empty consciousness, that emptiness of consciousness which is easy to imagine as empty space, that's okay. But really it's the empty nature of your own consciousness from which everything emerges. And what is the empty nature of your own consciousness? The similitude for it is dreamless sleep. It's a state of unity because there's awareness without any objects. It's a state of profound bliss except for the fact that we're not aware of the bliss because we haven't trained ourselves to be aware of what's going on in that state. Now, the great yogis 
who are practicing in Vajrayana can do that. They get into that space of dreamless sleep with awareness. And this is what they say. And as we learned from that little clip that I showed with the Dalai Lama, who was answering that question for that young lady at Monmouth University, who asked, What's the hap what is happiness? And how, how is it the same as or different than whatever else she asked about? I don't remember, the joy, contentment, or something else. And His Holiness went off on a riff for whatever reason. And he started talking about death and rebirth. And he said, it's the it's sixth mind that gets reborn. And so what was he talking about? And how does that relate to what I've just talked about, which is this mind of awareness without object, which we experience every night in dreamless sleep. And by the way, if we don't experience it, we go stark raving mad, completely crazy. We have to experience it for some period of time, every night, or we go completely nuts, which is very interesting if you think about it. It shows the importance of it. And we also have to dream or we go nuts, which is also very interesting. Okay, so let's get on to this. His Holiness said that the sixth mind, which is mental consciousness, is what goes from life to life. But he qualified that because he said the sixth mind has levels of coarseness and subtlety. So the sixth mind is operating in all of us right now. It's what's doing the thinking. It's what's trying to understand what I'm saying. <clears throat> it's the mind in me that is involved in the words that are coming out of my mouth. I'm just gonna say involved because the reason these words come out of my mouth is a bit more complicated. That's a whole other story. Um, that's the sixth mind. It's the dreaming mind. And it's the dreaming mind even when we're awake, right? Because when we're awake, like right now, the associational mind, the mind of image making, the mind of feelings is going on. It's operating right now. It's fully alive and engaged. But interestingly, so is the mind of dreamless sleep because it's the nature of mind itself, the actual nature of mind, the subtlest of the sixth mind, of the sixth mind is the mind of dreamless sleep. And it's with you all the time, but you're not aware of it because you're locked into the subject object duality that is required to get on in the world. And if you're a fully rational person, you're probably thinking that's the only thing that really exists is a mind, which is a subject that exists in relationship to objects, but you can break that habit. Tantra breaks that habit in a lot of different ways. For example, it's typical that we think I am thinking, I am sitting in this chair, I am watching this computer monitor. But if you think this thought, then you're aware of this thought and you're aware of I presumably being the agent who is sitting, I presumably being the agent who's watching, I presumably being the agent who's listening. And I say presumably, because if you develop the skill to designate that I onto white Tara, or designate that I onto Manjushri, or designate that I onto any of the other Bodhisattva images, then you recognize that it's not I that's aware, but there is awareness of I. There's consciousness of I. That consciousness is the subject and I is the object. And that's actually the truth of what goes on all the time. But we walk around being hypnotized. It's what Buddhists call delusion or ignorance, the first of the 12 links of dependent origination. Thinking I am doing 
rather than doing is happening and awareness of I in the process of the happening of doing is there. You can't even say it in English without being incredibly clumsy in the way you say it, right? Okay. Once you can become aware through this practice that there is awareness of I, once you become comfortable with this, then you can become comfortable with awareness of nothing whatsoever. So think about this, you see. Once you break the habit of I am the agent and practice awareness of I, awareness of body, awareness of sounds, and get comfortably settled into that awareness as it is, then you can get comfortably settled into awareness without any objects. Now, I'm not saying this is easy. I'm just saying that this is what the practice is, okay? When that happens, now you're a fully functional human being because all aspects of yourself are engaged at any given moment. Waking consciousness, dreaming consciousness, dreamless sleep consciousness are all fully engaged in every given moment. They're there now, but they're not fully engaged. You're not comfortable and aware of the possibility of being merely aware while all these other things are going on. Dream images, waking images, thoughts. But it's possible. And if that happens, then you are a Buddha. That's what a Buddha is. A Buddha is a being who is in all those places simultaneously aware of the true nature of consciousness, which is its emptiness nature, aware of the appearances that are there in consciousness, which is what we take to be the external and the internal world, and fully aware of mere awareness as the true nature of what I, I'm gonna say what I am, but that's not quite correct. The full, that's the fully, aware of the true nature of what is. Now, that awareness, as His Holiness says, is what's reborn. So this is a very important point, right? Because we're all going to die. There's no question about that. Most of us don't know when. Some of us may have some idea about when we're going to die because of some health issues, okay? But we all are going to die. And according to the Vajrayana teachings, when we die, everything sort of collapses back from physical into the mental and from the mental into pure consciousness. And then that pure consciousness is what goes on to another life. Now, a couple of things to say about this. For one thing, we'd have to ask, how does anybody know this? And why should I believe it? And that's a pretty good question. So I'll come back to that question in a little bit. We could say, well, wh why is this? I mean, why is it that consciousness or awareness does this? I mean, why is it that it doesn't just disappear when the body disappears? Okay. So there are various arguments about this. The problem with all of the arguments is that they're all couched in language. All the explanations are couched in language. So what do we know about language? Language is associated with a waking state of mind. And the waking state of mind has its own way of understanding. And just as the waking state of mind can't fully understand what dreaming consciousness is. Only dreaming consciousness understands what dreaming consciousness is. Neither can waking consciousness nor dreaming consciousness fully understand the experience 
of dreamless sleep. Now, it's not to say that you can't have the experience, because you can. If you couldn't, there would be no point to anything in Buddhism. It would be, that's all she wrote, forget about it, right? Because there would be no possibility of liberation. There would be no possibility of enlightenment. And these are what the goals are of all Buddhist practice, liberation and or enlightenment, okay? So you can experience it. And then presumably what's happened is that the teachers, excuse me, that the yogis who've experienced it have come back to tell us about it. But no matter what they tell us about it, they're telling us about it in words and words are always limited because all language is dialectical. You can't have any meaning to the word hot without the meaning of cold. Right is meaningless without left. Up has no meaning without down, right? Beginning has no meaning without end. It's just the way language is, right? So there are problems. It's not so much that there are problems with the yogis having the experience. The problem is with the yogis telling us or showing us about the experience. But that's all we've got, right? You know, Shakyamuni, the Buddha, was called the Muni, the silent one. He, not, he left an awful lot of discourses for being the silent one. Why did he leave all those discourses? Well, because he had to teach people something because he realized at a certain point that there were some people who could learn and they could practice and they could achieve something. Apparently after his enlightenment, he just didn't do anything. He thought, I can't communicate this to anybody. Well, I'm sure he didn't think I can't communicate this to anybody. I'm sure his experience was nobody gonna, nobody's gonna get this. This is too far. This is too subtle. They're not gonna get it. But being a compassionate being, he said, well, or thought or decided, I will share this to the extent that I can. And so that's what the words do. One of the teachings about the nature of consciousness is, of course, that it is impermanent. There is a mind stream is the way they talk about it. They do talk about the mind is existing over time. That's what gets reborn the mind stream. The clear light mind is the technical term for it. It's analogous to the um, state of dreamless sleep. Not quite the same, but analogous. It persists over time. That's what's reborn. How does it persist over time? And why is it said to be indestructible? Because it is said to be indestructible. Now, you might think that's good news, that your consciousness is indestructible. Ancient peoples thought that was really bad news. Let me out of this place. Um, I think there are good reasons for thinking both, quite frankly. Let me out of this place sounds good, but disappearing entirely. Oblivion, I don't know how good that sounds. Fortunately, there's a middle way, which is, I don't know what it is, but it's neither of the above. Anyway, they say one teaching is that the reason consciousness, the stream of consciousness is persistent is because it's composed of moments. That in the finger snap, here we go, here's the finger snap. There are, I believe, I recall that there were 37 moments of consciousness in one finger snap. I mean, back in the ancient days, of course, they didn't have clocks, they couldn't say, how many moments of consciousness were in a nanosecond or anything like that, but they could snap their fingers. Okay, what is a moment of consciousness? One way of thinking of a moment of consciousness is here's this moment like a stream, and as the stream goes by, here's another moment, and as the stream goes by, here's another moment, and there's not been any change. But there's another way of thinking about it. And this way of thinking about it is like a fluorescent light not an incandescent light or an LED, but a fluorescent light. Fluorescent lights, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, are powered by alternating current. 
and alternating current flips on and off. I think it's 60 times a second. Isn't that right? Steve would know this, shakes his head. 60 cycles a second, right? That means in one second, that fluorescent light goes on and off, on and off, on and off 60 times. But that's so fast, it seems like it stays on all the time. So one of the theories about consciousness that the ancient Buddhists had was your consciousness is like a fluorescent light. It flips on and off 37 times in the finger snap. And I knew a guy who said he'd seen it. I didn't know whether to believe him or not, but he said he'd seen it. And he validated that. What are the implications of that? If consciousness goes on and off, and every time it goes off, it goes back on again. And every time it goes on, it goes back off again. That means that it's self-creating and self-destroying. And if it's self-creating and self-destroying, then nothing can create it, nothing can destroy it. Because it self-creates and self-destroys. And that's why the mind stream goes on forever. Now, the Buddhists have enough sense to say, we can't really know the origin, and we can't know the end of these things, because that's logically impossible. If you say, this is where consciousness came from, then you'd have to say what existed before consciousness. And then you get into the eternal regress of what was that and where did that come from? So they say, these things are unknowable and they refuse to go to that conversation. But they do say that consciousness, the stream of consciousness, is unending. And that's what goes from life to life. And that's the reason it has to go from life to life. Because it can't be destroyed. It may be something that can achieve nirvana, can achieve peace, can achieve enlightenment, but that doesn't mean it can be obliterated. So that's either the good news or the bad news, depending upon how you want to take it. I take nirvana to be good news, but you know, that I get reborn that's a mixed bag. As I said, I don't ever want to have to go to high school again, but <laughs> I might have to go to high school again. The really good news though, is that there are heavens. You can get reborn in heaven. You can get reborn as an animal. I mean, if you happen to get reborn as our kitty Betty, you've done pretty well because she's got a really luxurious life. <laughs> she doesn't have to worry about anything. We feed her whatever she wants. She gets to come inside and it's nice and warm. If she wants to be outside, we have a heated cat house for her. I mean, as, as kitty lives go, she's got it pretty good. So if I got reborn as Betty, I don't think that that would be so bad. Although the Buddhists say that the bad news is that you can't learn the Dharma because you can't think if you're a cat. Of course, the really bad news is you could be reborn as any kind of animal. And the worst news is you could be reborn as a ghost or the even worse news is you could be reborn in hell. I mean, if there's gonna be heaven, there's gonna be hell. That's the bad news. So there's good news that goes with the bad news. I'm looking forward to heaven. The way you get to heaven is by accumulating good karma. The way you don't go to heaven is by accumulating bad karma. And what's bad karma? Well, we know what bad karma is. I don't really need to go into it. We know meanness, harshness, antagonism, and also stupidity in the philosophical sense of stupidity is what's responsible for this. Fundamentally delusion, okay? Fortunately, we have the Dharma to counteract delusion. Okay. All these things are achievable and the great lamas have given us the roadmap and they've given us the grace to travel on this road. And they've given us the ability to experience some of what this looks like through our intimate mental relationship with the lamas. I'm not gonna go back to this. I talked about the relationship with the lama and guru yoga earlier. But fun, I'll just say fundamental to this practice is the relationship with the lama because the lama is the one who's achieved these things already. He's the exemplar or she's the exemplar because they're both male and female lamas. They're the model for us and they can show us in their being what this is. When my wife met our first um, Vajrayana teacher, Tara Tilker, 
she said, I want him to be my teacher because this is the kind of person I want to be. This is who I want to be. That would be a great achievement. I mean, he was the retired abbot of Utah Monastery. He was quite a developed human being, very remarkable in every way. But he represented something that was a goal, an ideal. So these lamas are still around. They're the ones that initiate us into Vajrayana practice. And they show us these techniques. They open the door for us to reconnect, to perhaps go on the archaeological dig into our own deepest nature and bring it forth and integrate it with our conscious mind. Right. So Whitmont didn't know about Vajrayana. <clears throat> he didn't know the techniques were there. He thought that for modern people, the grail myth was what was going to be needed to become whole. I don't know about that. The grail myth is complicated. I know Vajrayana is something that can make us whole. And by the way, in highest yoga tantra, the deities hold a skull bowl filled with blood, which by the way, is nothing more or less than a grail. A grail was the cup that received the blood of Christ. Right? So in Vajrayana, there is a grail. Whitman didn't know about it though. But we can find out and we can practice with it. So that, that concludes what I have to say. And um, thank you for being here. It's um, the only way I get to teach is if they're students. I depend on you. I only get to be a teacher if they're students. Um, I teach at university, so I have students there, but I don't teach this, not at the university. They'd throw me out of the philosophy department if they knew what I was talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> so there is time for questions. If anyone has questions, please raise your hand, speak up. I'll be glad to take them in the time that remains. Yes, David. Yeah, I have a question about my Tawa practice. <clears throat> Power practice? Tawa. Oh, Tawa. Go ahead. It, it relates to the last session. So when we speak about the, out of the emptiness of our mind, uh, we have the Tom and the Tom radiates light and the light comes back into the Tom. And I'm not sure either we generate ourselves as Tara or Tara transforms into us. Tara, okay, the Tom transforms into the image of Tara. That is you. But when you're doing this practice, you don't know it. You have to make the conscious effort to think I am Tara at that point. Now, if you get really good, that will happen naturally. As soon as the Tom arises, you will naturally feel you are Tom. And as soon as the Tara arises out of the Tom, you will naturally feel you are Tara. But when you're beginning the practice, and even after you've done the practice for a long time, you have to make the effort. Your rational mind has to say, okay, now, David, remember, designate yourself on Tara and practice being Tara. And then I, you will feel like Tara, you will be Tara, you will enact Tara, and you will have the capacities of Tara. As I said, they were always there, but you didn't know it. So you have to remind yourself that they're there. You have to play a game with yourself as it were. Not, I don't know if it's like playing solitaire or something. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I'm not a game player, so I'm not quite sure what it would be like. But it is, it's a little bit like a game where you have to remind yourself of what you already are. I know that sounds strange, but you have to remind yourself of what you are. Maybe it's like, um, you wake up in the morning. I don't know if you're a parent or not. Let's say you're a parent 
and you wake up in the morning and you had a really crappy night's sleep, you know, and you, it's like there's something horrible going on at work and you didn't sleep well and you wake up and you're incredibly grouchy and all you can think about when you get up is, oh, I'm nuts. I have to go to work today and I'm going to have to deal with this problem. What a pain in the behind. And your little four-year-old son runs into the room and jumps on your bed and says, hi, daddy. And he's, oh, yeah, I'm a father too, right? So while you're being grouchy and unhappy about work, you weren't thinking about the fact that you're a father, but you never stopped being a father. Then your little son runs into the room or your little daughter runs into the room and reminds you, oh, I'm a daddy. In addition to, you know, being a wage slave or whatever else is going on, you know? Did you ever stop being dad? No, but you were being reminded that you were dad. And when your child jumps on you in bed, ah, I'm dad again. So it's like that. That's what I mean about reminding yourself, playing a game with yourself. Does that make sense? Well, in terms of the time that transforms into Tara, in, in our physical body, is it, is that taking place at our heart? It takes place in your mind. But the thing is, there's always body, speech, and mind together. Body, speech, and mind are always together. And with every thought, with every concept, with every image, there is also an associated energy, right? So I talked about this earlier. We talked about the horse and the rider. I don't know if you, if you caught that particular part of the talks that I was doing, right? So in every type of consciousness, the consciousness has a sort of um, a, a cognitive knowing aspect and it has a, an energetic aspect. And the cognitive knowing is like the rider of the horse and the horse is like the energetic part. The energetic part carries the thoughts and the thoughts direct the energy. That's the way it's, it's taught. If you, well, I, no, I'm not gonna go there. Uh, I almost got sidetracked. So when the Tom arises, it's a thought, it's an image in your mind, but with it, there's an energy, there's an energy associated with that image. And you could feel that energy in your body but you don't necessarily want to have the tongue in your body. I mean, you could. There are practices where you imagine um, different letters in different parts of your body. There are practices where you do this sort of thing. But in the case of the white Tara, especially when you're beginning practice, it's mostly important to remember that the Tom arises out of the emptiness of your own consciousness because you want it to be luminous. You don't want it to be solid. You want to know it comes out of your mind rather than out of your physical body. So it, it will, at, as you practice, it will sometimes seem to be in your body. Sometimes it will seem to be outside of your body. You can imagine yourself as being Tara floating in the space behind yourself. You can imagine yourself as Tara floating in the space inside of your skin. All these things can happen naturally. But the main thing is you want to keep, you want to keep Tara non-material. You want to keep Tara mental in that sense and luminous. Does this make sense? So that luminous energy could reside in a spot in your body. That's okay, but it's most important that it stay a luminous, a luminous image. He didn't want to stay outside. She didn't want to stay outside. That's I don't it. know how they got in. <laughs> um, when they so love you, they're good at that. So, all right, thanks. <laughs> okay, all right. I see we're going to be distracted here. Other questions while we have time, if any. Steve? Oh, hey, David. Um, it's kind of an observation more than a question, but I'd, I'd like to get your feedback on it. So on, in my Thursday class of Meditation 101, I had a really good question. I'm still thinking about how I answered it. It was a question uh, by one of the students about, well, um, there's different styles of practice that we see at the center. And some seem to be more like rational, academic, intellectual. 
and others are more devotional practices. And the example given was um, sogs or pujas and so on. Right. And there, the question was, well, which is better? Um, and I kind of, I sort of, I just ballparked an answer. <laughs> what did you say? Well, what, what I said was that they're both part of a whole. And when we look at, you know, senior teachers at the center, like I guess she share up, he seems to be able to combine the two. But what occurred to me, I'm glad I came to this class, is that in a sense, it's also a combination of the rational and the mythic. That's, I would say. Yes. Yeah, and they're both, they're, they're complementary, and it's really the, in the end, it's the fusion. And we may take, and, you know, personally, I kind of follow the sutra path, because I find it very, you know, I'm devoted to it, but there's also the Vajrayana path. I just don't feel I'm ready for that. Um, it's a combination of the two. Yeah. And so I think it really kind of gelled when you, when you kind of, when I heard you talk about the mythic and, and the rational approach to this, and it's not either one is better. It's just which way we start up the mountain. But I also yeah. wonder, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say they're both better. Yeah, they're, yeah, <laughs> neither, so, both. <laughs> yeah. So what were you gonna say next? Um, I also wonder if maybe there's like a third element to it, just like extending it to dreamless sleep, where in both the mythic and in the rational approach, we recognize the emptiness of, of all of the objects we engage in, in both rational and mythic or Vajrayana type practices. Yeah. Absolutely. The only thing I would add to that is that we can start off by having a rational understanding of emptiness. <clears throat> then we can practice with the experience of the bodhisattva deities being empty. And then we can recognize the empty character of our own consciousness, which is the matrix for all of these things that are happening. There's a, a phrase that I like a whole lot that um, is in something that Mipon Rinpoche wrote. He was a Nyingma Lama. Um, and he talked about realization as, let's see if I can get this language straight. The wisdom consciousness or the wisdom mind that knows the expanse of emptiness. The wisdom that knows the expanse of emptiness. The expanse of emptiness is when everything is understood to be devoid of inherent existence, where everything is experienced as devoid of emptiness, of inherent existence. It's called direct seeing when you directly experience everything as emptiness. Appearance, emptiness coexist in the same moment and the wisdom mind knows it. And the wisdom mind knows that it's the wisdom mind. I was about to say that I know that I'm the wisdom mind, but it's the wisdom mind knows its own wisdom blissfulness and knows the expanse of emptiness all in the same moment over a sequence of moments that's enlightenment by that definition sounds good huh yeah it does sound good other questions okay then well thanks for coming this will get recorded if you want to come back to it. That's been my pleasure. I hope it's been good for you. Good night, wherever you are. <laughs>